Snowflow Church, so glad you guys are here. It's been a great day already. Uh, any day that we get to see someone say yes to Jesus, like our friend Katya did today, it is a good, good day. So I just want to celebrate God for that. And it's a rainy day out there, but I'm so glad you're here. It's, it's, it's a good day. So, so today, uh, we are going to be turning a corner in the study uh, we've been doing. Uh, last month, uh, we've been in the series called Alive, and we've been studying through uh, the New Testament letter of Ephesians, but today we're literally uh, turning a corner as we get into chapter four. We began this study with this quote that says this, that if we spent more time telling people who they are, we could spend less time telling them how to act. And I love that idea. I, I love that quote. I use that quote a lot, and it's so, so true that, that if we tell people more about who they are, we could spend less time telling people how to act, because the idea here is that our identity has everything to do with our behavior. Now, the guy named the Apostle Paul who wrote this letter to the Ephesian Christians, he wrote at least 13 other uh, writings in the New Testament, and you would find uh, that he oftentimes followed this pattern, that he'd begin with identity talk, and then he would get into behavior. Not behavior, and then identity. He would say, here's who you are, and because this is who you are, this then is how you are to live. And, and so that's what we've been doing so far in this study of Ephesians. In the first three chapters, it has just been filled with identity language. He's been writing to people that, that they say they live in Christ. That's his way to talk about people that have said yes to Jesus, people that have been forgiven, people that are on their way to heaven, people that have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of them. He says, if, if you're in Christ, he says, you're, you're, not, you're not just servants. He said, you're children. And you're not just children, you're children of God that like he intentionally adopted you into the family of God. If you're in Christ, that's who you are. And not only are you children, but as his children, he said, you guys make up the church. And as the church, the Bible talks about us as being the, the bride of Christ. This is all identity language. He's been saying, here's who you are. Here's who you are. If you're in Christ, you're a child and, and you're the church. And if you're the church, you're the bride of Christ. Here's, here's who you are. And because this is who you are, then, then, then here's how you need to be living. And, and so he says it this way in chapter four, verse one. He says, as a prisoner, remember he's sitting in a prison cell as he's writing this letter. He just wouldn't stop preaching about Jesus, so they put him in chains. He said, as a prisoner of the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. So here he's like, because all that's true about who you are, I want you to live a worthy life. Now that word worthy is, is very, very important in the original Greek language that Ephesians would have been written in. That word worthy could be translated to balance the scales. And so his idea is that the scales should be balanced, that, that if you say you believe this, then, then you live this way. If you live this way, it's because you believe this. The scales are going to balance one way or another. You're gonna live the way you believe, and again, get it, that's identity language, that when you really believe who you are, then you will live a certain way. And so he's gonna spend the rest of this letter to the Ephesians giving some really practical instructions about how to live a life worthy of this calling we received as the children of God, as the church, as the bride of Christ. So he says this, skipping down to verse 17, he says, so I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. And so Paul starts out there, beginning of verse 17, and he said, hey, no longer live as the Gentiles do. Now the question we appropriately have to ask again is, well, who are the Gentiles? Well, in the Bible, Gentiles is used a couple of different ways. One way, Gentiles typically would refer to everyone that was not Jewish, 
Remember, there was two groups of people then. There was uh, Jews and there was the everyone else. And the everyone else, they were called Gentiles, like a big conglomeration of people, Gentiles. But here, when he says Gentiles, no longer live as the Gentiles do, he's really, in a sense, referring to the, to the secular culture at large. He was like, hey, hey, everyone out there, don't live the way they live. If we were gonna make it really practical for us, we would just say it this way. We would say, no longer live as the Americans do. Like, like that's, that's what he would say to us. And that'd be a, an accurate translation, contextually, what he's saying to them. Don't live like the Gentiles do. He's saying to us, don't, don't live like all the other Americans do. And it's an accurate translation because you don't have to stretch much to realize that this first century city of Ephesus is really you know, 21st century America, South Florida, West Palm, where we live, it's, it's the same. There's some obviously differences in terms of culture and language and place and time, but the mindset especially is the same. Can I describe the mindset for you this way? If, if it feels good, do it. You believe what fits your lifestyle and I'll believe what fits my lifestyle. You do you, I'll do me. Uh, you worry about you, I'll worry about me. And, and this is most important too. Whatever desires you have, fulfill those. Whatever desires there, just make sure you fulfill those. The worst thing you could ever do is have a desire and leave that unfulfilled, fulfill that desire. Can we look around our our city that we love and our state we love, our country we love and say, yeah, that's the prevailing mindset of the day. There was a guy named Steve Turner. He was an English professor and he wrote an admittedly sarcastic essay about our culture and this was even years ago. Just, Just listen to sort of how he mapped out this world we're living in. He wrote, we believe in Marx, Freud, and Darwin, We believe everything is okay as long as you don't hurt anyone according to your definition of hurt. We believe in sex before, during, and after marriage. We believe in the therapy of sin. We believe adultery is fun, and we believe taboos are taboo. We believe everything is getting better despite all the evidence to the contrary. We believe there's something in horoscopes, UFOs, and bent spoons. We believe Jesus was a good man just like Muhammad, Buddha, and ourselves. He was a good moral teacher, although we think basically his good morals were really bad. We believe after death comes nothing because when you ask the dead what happens, they say nothing. If death is not the end and the dead have lied, then it's compulsory heaven for all except perhaps Hitler and Stalin. We believe that man is essentially good and it's only his behavior that lets him down. This is the fault of society. Society is the fault of conditions and conditions are the fault of society. We believe that each man must find truth that is right for him and reality will adapt accordingly. We believe there's no absolute truth except the truth that there is no absolute truth. That that essay is admittedly, he said, sarcastic, but, but it also more and more and more kind of accurately portrays this culture in which we live. He was more prophetic than maybe he realized he was being at the time. This is the essence of our life. This is the essence of our time. You don't need me to tell you that we have been, we are, and we will continue to be in an absolute moral freefall as a country. This is not anything new. I hear people say all the time, well, this is the worst it's ever been. I don't know. I know it's not good, but we're in like this absolute moral free fall. I'm not even gonna go into spelling out the specifics of what I mean by that because it's just obvious, like watch the news, get on social media, actually don't get on social media, like listen to the conversation at work and you're just gonna know it is just collapsing around us. Because that's true, there are many people that live in Christ, many people that are children of God that are tempted to retreat, retreat from culture to pull away from. When I say retreat, I mean to disassociate from, to run from, to hide from. They they see, man, this is broken. There's no moral compass. The foundation is crumbling more and more. We're in a complete free fall. I'm gonna disassociate from, run from, hide from culture. And when I say culture, I mean people. The problem is when we as people who live in Christ decide we're gonna disassociate from, run from, hide from people, it's totally contrary to the purpose of our lives as people that live in Christ. Jesus said this to us and about us. He said, you are the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. Salt and light, you think, what do they have in common? Well, salt and light, they're both agents of change. They change their surroundings. That's why salt is no good at all if it's just sitting in the salt shaker. Light is no good when it's in light. Light does really, really good when you place it 
in the darkest places. Jesus said this about himself and about us. He said, you're, you're the salt of the earth. You are the, you're the light of the world. Salt and light are change agents, and, and so are we. And so retreating from, pulling away from, disassociating from, hiding from the people of our culture is completely contrary to what Jesus has called us to do and to be. It sounds noble. It sounds righteous. It may feel tempting, but it is totally contrary to what Jesus has called us to do and to be. We're not called to, to disassociate from culture. We should be like right in the midst of culture as people that live in Christ. Think about it this way, that as people that have said yes to Jesus, the call in our lives, it's not to hide out, it's to go out. Like Jesus said to go. And I've got to tell you this, if and when we settle, and this can happen at varying degrees, but if and when we settle as people who live in Christ, to, to just settle to live in our little Christian subcultures, and if we ever escape the Christian subculture, we get into another Christian subculture as fast as we possibly can so we can disassociate from, hide from, run from the people that are living in our culture, what we in our Christian subculture are saying to the culture is you can go to hell. And I, I hope I speak for all of us. I do speak for this church, and I will do it boldly. Uh, we will not settle for that. We're not ever gonna settle, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how much it unravels, no matter how much the moral compass is totally jacked up, and it is. We are never gonna settle to just exist in little Christian subcultures all the while we watch the world going to hell in a handbasket. We're not gonna do that, because why? We have a mission, and it's a love mission, and it's a people mission, and so we've gotta work and live and play amongst people. The, the Bible talks about it this way, paraphrasing, that we are to be in the world, but not of the world. That's not just a cliche, that's some like really strong biblical truth. So not in the world, we, we, don't, we wanna be in the world, but not of the world. And so retreating from what is happening all around us, that is not what we can do but we also can't just settle to blend in. And here's what a whole lot of us do. It's kind of we do one or the other because like I don't know what the other option is. So it's like, I'm gonna retreat, I'm just gonna stay away from that, or I'm just gonna blend in because like when in Rome, you know, what can, what can I really do? And so this is the way it really goes in our lives as people that live in Christ. There's a book years ago called The Scandal of the Evangelical Conscience uh, written by a man named Ron Sider. In the subtitle of the book, he said, why are Christians living just like the rest of the world? And in the book, he, he shares these concerning statistics about, about racism and spouse abuse and premarital sex and materialism and addiction to pornography and, and gambling and all these behaviors. And he finds all of that is almost as common among people who live in Christ as those who don't even claim to live in Christ. And so he comes to this conclusion that every day the church is becoming more like the world it allegedly seeks to change. Now, now, Sider's book says that there is one small subset of people that do live distinctly different lives. So they're like, wow, there's something different about that. They're just like living different. They're not blending in and they're not retreating. And he says there are people that live with a biblical worldview. And you can kind of define biblical worldview a few different ways, but let me just tell you the way he talked about a biblical worldview. He said, someone that the way they see the world, it's someone who believes God is all-knowing, all-powerful creator. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. Satan is real, salvation is a free gift. Every Christian has a personal responsibility to share the good news, and the Bible is totally accurate in all that it teaches. And so he says, okay, the people that are living with a biblical worldview say these are the things I believe, so this is the way I live. They do actually end up living distinctly different lives than the rest of the Americans do, than the way the rest of the Gentiles do. But here's the sobering reality. He said, okay, yeah, people that live with a biblical worldview they live a distinctly different life, but then according to his study and others, he said, and about 9% of people that say they live in Christ actually live with a biblical worldview. So nine out of 100 people that say they live for Jesus actually live according to what Jesus said is true in the Bible. And so in all of these ways, we've been influenced by the world and we're increasingly losing the ability to have any kind of influence on the world. And it isn't, it isn't, I believe, that we're purposely like chasing after immorality. 
I don't think it's purposely that we're welcoming in impurity. I think it's just that living in a culture like we live, it just deadens our sensitivity. We just completely lose the ability to to even filter anymore the good from the bad, the the righteous from the unholy, the the pure from the impure. And, And it goes without saying, like our world, our culture doesn't place like a great premium on purity, right? Like that's not kind of what's going on in the world right now. There's a whole lot of impurity. I remember once reading an article, I don't know why I was reading this, mostly because I live a fairly boring life, but I was reading an article about the Food and Drug Administration, and see, I told you, boring life, and it was about the, the standards they follow when determining acceptable levels of impurity in the food that we eat. I'm gonna share it with you, okay? And I need to tell you now, if you were hungry when you came in, you're not gonna be hungry when you go out. So here you go. So these are like real. This is what the FDA follows when they decide if our food can be put on the shelves or not. Apple butter. I'm glad I don't even eat apple butter. But it says this, if the mold count is 12% or more, if it averages four rodent hairs per 100 grams or more, if it averages five or more whole insects per 100 grams, the FDA will pull the whole thing from the shelves. Otherwise, it'll just go right into your English muffins. So be careful with your bagels after church today. Coffee beans, any coffee drinkers here? Yeah, I'm gonna tell you. You may not be after this. You may want to take your final sip. Coffee beans will get ruthlessly withdrawn from the market if an average of 10% or more are insect infested or if there's one live insect in each of two or more immediate containers. You're welcome for the free coffee. You get what you pay for, okay? Uh, What about mushrooms? And I believe mushrooms are exhibit of a fallen world anyway, so I don't eat them, but mushrooms can't be sold if there's an average of 20 or more maggots of any size per 15 grams of dried mushrooms. I told you you shouldn't be eating mushrooms. (laughs) Fig paste, if there are more than 13 insect heads per 100 grams of fig paste in each of two or more subsamples, the FDA throws the whole batch out. Hot dogs? You don't want to know. Uh, I guess, because I love gas station hot dogs, so I'm not even going to read that. So here's the thing. I, I, guess, I guess the FDA decided that total purity would be really impossible to achieve, and so, well, just a little bit of impurity. Yeah, okay. And, and isn't that sort of how we build out our lives, too? It's like we're living in this culture, we're living in this time, we're living surrounded by all this noise and all this media and all these opportunities. There'd be no way to actually live a fully pure life. So like, there's some impurity in our lives. Ah, It's not as bad as him or her. It's not that big of a deal. And so the bar just gets lowered and lowered and lowered and lowered and lowered and lowered and lowered on what it would be to live a pure life. Like 50 years ago, I wasn't around then, but I hear that like 50 years ago, that like it was like scandalous, the idea of a Christian going to a movie in a movie theater. They wouldn't go. Now, I'm not subscribing to that idea. I love going to the movies. I love $40 popcorn, don't you? Like I love to go to the movies. But now, many of us, including me, we, we may go to a movie without even giving any thought what's gonna be in the movie. Oh, it looks good. I saw the trailer, the neighbors saw it, the guys at work were talking about it. I'm, I'm gonna go to that movie and it, it, we don't even maybe give a thought to, to what's in it or what's gonna happen or what we're gonna see or, or what we're gonna experience and we just, we just go and, and we find ourselves entertained by laughing at shows like, I'm not even gonna fill in that blank for you. Because if I did, if I named a show or shows, and it was your show or shows, you have to watch, you have to binge, you have to see, you may get like, well, a little defensive, and you wanna get in a fight with me, and I don't wanna fight with you today, and, and so you'd miss the larger point, but if I said like a series of shows that are out there that you gotta watch now, and I didn't list yours, you kinda get a free pass, like I'm good, and you would miss the whole purpose as well. So I would ask you, what's your favorite show? What do you have to binge? What do you have to watch? What are you counting down the days or the months until the new season comes out? What is that? Only you know what it is. Think about that show and then, and then think about the content. Think about what, it, I know some of you are mad at me right now. Like think about what it, I just ruined your summer. Think about what it says. Think about what you're gonna see. Think about what you're going to hear. And, and then I would say like that idea of evaluation, take that to all the areas of our life of what we let inside of our minds. And so, you know, what, what music is it that you love to sing to and you know every word of? What, what, what movie, what series do you binge? What, what books are you reading? What, what, is it gonna be? what concert do you wanna go to? What is it? Evalu- evaluate it all and say, man, is that, 
Is that gonna be really good for someone that lives in Christ? Is that gonna be really good for someone that has a heavenly calling on the life? Is that gonna be really good for somebody who wants to live a life worthy of the calling we receive? Is that gonna be good? I wanna tell you this, this, this idea of evaluating our lives and what we're allowing into our lives, it is not about being legalistic. Like my mom's here today and she would tell you, we grew up in a church that was like uber, uber legalistic. And if you don't know what legalistic means, let me tell you what it means. Legalistic means that basically faith becomes all about, and in the most extreme examples, only about following rules. And so you know really clearly I did, here's the do's and here's the don'ts. And if you do the do's and don't do the don'ts, I think that's like a triple negative, I don't know. But like if you do the do's and don't do the don'ts, then, then you're good, you're a good Christian. And can I tell you, I was a good Christian because I did all the do's and I didn't do the don'ts. And then for a long time, I lived under the false belief that I was really following Jesus well. I wasn't because I was following the rules well. I wasn't following Jesus well. It is not the same. So this, this is not about legalism. It's not about getting an A on the test. It's not about being a good Christian. There's no such thing as a good Christian. There's people that live in Christ and, and those who don't live in Christ. However, God said, be holy like I am holy. And so we, we wanna live this way. We wanna become more and more like God. We wanna be a greater influence in this world and on this world. And so this evaluation of our lives what we're entertained by, what we laugh at, what we see, what we listen to. I, listen, it's cumbersome, it's inconvenient, it's frustrating, it can be annoying, but it's worth it because it can keep us very, very alert. We live in a culture that if we just go with the flow, it will absolutely and completely deaden our sensitivity to any kind of impurity. That is how we arrived at this place in the first place, that every day the church is becoming more like the world it's seeking to change. And so if we wanna reverse that, if we wanna live differently, it begins with our thinking. Verse 17, Paul said, you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. Don't race out of here and be like, well, I'm not gonna do that anymore, and I'm not gonna do that anymore, and I'm not gonna do it. It doesn't start with our behaviors. It starts with our thinking. It starts with our hearts. It's why Jesus, all the time in his ministry, he would talk about the internal and very little actually about the external because he knew that if our minds are right and our hearts are right, then our lives will also be right and holy and admirable in his sight. That is why, interestingly, Jesus oftentimes went toe to toe with a group of people that may surprise you, church people. Like in his culture, you did not see him going toe to toe with people we wanna go toe to toe with. He went toe to toe with people like us, religious people, church people. Good people, why? Because on the outside, man, it looked good. They went to church and they sang the songs and they gave the money and they were wagging their finger at everyone else in the culture who was not doing those things. And he was like, yeah, you got it on the outside, but you don't have it on the inside. He one time said this to them and I think it's rude what he said, but he said, you guys, and it was like us guys, he said, you guys are like whitewashed tombs. Man, you look so good on the outside, you're dead on the inside. Told you it was rude. Like he said that to people like us and because it's the inside that comes out. And that's why Jesus said this in his Sermon on the Mount. He said, a good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. It all begins in the mind. Paul, the author of Ephesians, was convinced of this. That's why he, this theme shows up over and over again in his writings. Listen to what he said in Romans 12:2. He said, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Philippians 4.8, he wrote, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Paul knew that you will become what you think about the most. You will become what you think about the most. That's not literally true. If it was, I would turn into a piece of pepperoni pizza because I think about that way too often. It's embarrassing. So it's not like literally, but figuratively, you will become what you think about the most. Your thoughts will shape the life. There was a, a two book a volume of books here, or two, two volume series of books called The Criminal Personality. And, and the authors of that book, they did some deep study on, on criminals that end up spending a whole lot of their lives 
in prison, but they took a different angle on studying how did these criminals become criminals, and they didn't focus on their feelings, and they didn't focus on the background, and they didn't focus on how they were nurtured growing up. They thought it was more to it than that, and, and listen to some of what they wrote. They said that the idea that a man becomes a criminal because he's corrupted by his environments has proved to be too weak of an explanation. We've indicated that criminals come from a broad spectrum of homes, both disadvantaged and privileged within the same neighborhood. Some are violators, most are not. It's not the environment that turns a man into a criminal. It is a series of choices that he makes starting at a very early age. But it's true for criminal. It's true for someone living in Christ. That the series of thoughts you have, the series of choices you make, shape the life you live, which means this, what Paul is saying to us, is that feudal Thinking leads to feudal living. Now, when Paul used the word feudal there, this is very, very important. When he talked about the Gentiles and their futility, he was not talking about the value of their lives. Gentiles, Americans, us, incredibly valuable people made in the image of God on purpose, with a purpose. There's no question about the value. When he, when he talks about futility, he's talking about uh, the, the style of their lives. And in fact, you take feudal or futility and a synonym, synonym of that in the Greek language would be empty. It's like the empty way of their lives. And, and isn't the word empty a very fitting way to describe the life that we were just pushed to chase after all the days of our life, like you gotta go, 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 get it, get it, get it, have it, have it, have it, achieve it, get it, earn it. it we're just taught from like babies, it's like, man, whatever you do in life, chase after like praise and promotion and possessions and popularity and pleasure and get more of it and more of it, more of it, do whatever you can to have more of it and chase it and get it and that, it's gonna be great. And, and not until people get to the end of their lives and they see their bank accounts full and their contacts list is full, and their garage is full, and their closet is full, to find that their heart is empty. Because we're taught to chase this empty life, and it's, it, becomes, it starts here, because what we value here, what we believe here, happens out there. So what we think is gonna be pleasurable, we're gonna get out there. What we think is gonna be satisfying, we're gonna chase after. What we think is gonna bring us contentment and, and peace, we're gonna chase after, and we just end up empty. Our mind is the filter into our souls. And so what we allow to linger too long in our minds, it's gonna, it's gonna wreck our souls. I'm, re, I'm reminded of the, the little... The little song I was taught at the legalistic church where I grew up. But I'm glad I learned this song. It was, oh, be careful little eyes what you see. Be careful little eyes what you see. I wish I would have always followed that. That's what Paul's saying to them and to us. He's saying, be careful what your eyes see. Be careful what your ears hear because your mind is the filter into your soul. And the more you allow into our soul, the more and more we lose the ability to have an influence on this world. We become more and more like the world we're hoping to change. And, and so if we really want to reverse this, we really do want to live distinct lives and we can carry out this purpose and mission that we have, it takes a conscious decision that we're going to do so. That's why, by the way, that repentance plays such a crucial role in this decision to follow Jesus. Like when someone comes to me and they read scriptures, like, man, I wanna say yes to Jesus, I wanna follow Jesus. What do we do? Well, the Bible says what to do. It says you repent, and repentance means you change your mind. And then you're baptized, but you start with repent. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna live in a different way, man. I'm gonna live on a different frequency. I'm gonna move in a different direction. We, we repent, we move out of that old life. The problem is we oftentimes end up reverting back to it. In verse 20, Paul reminded the Ephesian Christians what took place when they accepted the teachings of Jesus. He said, you, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him accord, in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And so one of the most common images you'll find in the Bible to talk about life with Jesus is, is that you've moved away from the old and then you've entered into the new. Second Corinthians 5, verse 17, Paul wrote, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Romans 6, 4 through 6, it gives this beautiful picture of baptism here. He said, we were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ is raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have a new life. 
If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with. And then our Ephesians 4 passage, verse 22, he said, you were taught with regards to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its evil desires, to be made new in the attitudes of your minds and to put on the new self. And so this idea of being in Christ and you, you take off the old and then you put on the new, it is this dominant theme in the writings of Paul about here's what it is to follow Jesus. The problem is we often don't really understand how and what we're be called to do there. During college, um, the class I struggled with the most was grammar. Well, I also flunked my first preaching class, but that's another story for another day. It's true, okay? You should be very proud of your pastor, all right? So I really did, but grammar was rough, like uh, mostly because it required diagramming sentences. And I need to tell you about this. I grew up in Kansas. We barely spoke in complete sentences. I had no idea how to diagram sentences. We had to diagram sentences, and then this class took place at seven o'clock in the morning, which I think is cruel and unusual punishment. Like, if you know me, you know there's two things I dislike, mornings and people who like mornings. I know some of you are in here, but I hated grammar. And our professor, Rex Wolf, he would prance in there at 7 a.m. He loved grammar. So I got a D plus in that class. I'm kind of proud of the plus I got. But I'm telling you all that to tell you, I'm not an expert in grammar at all. Some of you picked that up by listening to me week by week. I'm not an expert on grammar, but in this passage, you need to understand the grammar. When, when that verb is used to put off the old self, it refers to a once and for all action. That you get this new life. You take off the old self. The old life is died. It is crucified. It is left behind. You resurrect up in to a new life, it is a once and for all action. What I think though is that we many times turn it into an every now and then action. Let me explain it to you this way. So take, take a look at these pants. They are frayed and torn up and stained and holy. Holy, I don't mean like spiritually, I mean like holy. Like they have holes in here and they're getting bigger all the time. These, these are holy. These are my jeans. I, I bought these jeans like, I don't know, like 10 years ago. And they're just, they're just so, so worn out. They're, they're old. And, and I can't tell you how many times I've meant to get rid of these jeans. I was gonna get rid of them. I put them in like the garage sale pile. I put them in the trash pile. I, I carried them downstairs so they could be closer to the door. I was, gonna, I was gonna get rid of them for all the reasons I just said. They don't fit right. They're, they, they don't look right. They're stained. They're ugly. They're nasty. Like holes in jeans can be okay, but when you have chicken legs like me, you don't wanna see behind the jeans, okay? So it's like not good in my case. I've been like, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna get rid of these old jeans. But every time, including this week, literally, that I went to my closet, the jeans keep being there. They're like magical jeans. They keep showing up in my closet. And do you, know what I, do you know what I do when I see them in the closet? I put them on. I'm gonna wear these jeans today. And then I put these jeans on. I'm like, these are comfortable jeans. I love these jeans. I have so many good memories in these jeans. I'm keeping these jeans. And then I go through this cycle over and over and over. And yet the, the old jeans that I'm gonna get rid of, I'm gonna be done with, they're gonna be out of my house. They're still there. And I keep putting them on. And I keep wearing them. And that is a picture of what Paul is telling us, the old life. That if you're living in Christ, some of you are, you, you repented, so did I. And that we're changing our mind about the way we're gonna live. We're gonna live different lives because the Holy Spirit of God is living inside of us. We're gonna, we gonna live these different lives. The, the old is gone and the new has come. We've repented of that, it, it's gone. But if we're honest, most of us who live in Christ, we've kept some things. We've held on to them because they're comfortable and they're familiar. And honestly, we kind of like it. And so maybe for you, it's a, it's a way of talking. Maybe it's the way you handle money. Maybe it's your sexual behaviors or maybe it's the way you... You, you treat the people around you. You say you love the most, but because you're so comfortable, you're oppressive to them and you're, you're kind of mean to them and you're, you're sarcastic to them. Or, or maybe it's kind of the way you behave when you're on road trips and no one else is around. You can kind of do you and no one has to know. No one's gonna get, get hurt. And, and, and there's, these, there's these things, these old ways of life out there that we kind of keep. And, and every now and then we, we get them out and we wear them. And we dabble with them and we play with them and we have fun with them and we, we comfort ourselves with them. 
and we gotta, we gotta get rid of them. We gotta be done. We can't be hiding it in the closet. We can't keep hiding it in our wallet or hiding it in the app on the phone or hiding it in the glove box or hiding it in the hotel room when we go on the business trips and no one else is alone. It's like the, the old, I know it's comfortable and I know it's familiar, but it isn't, it isn't good for us. We gotta just get, get rid, we gotta get rid of the old. Now listen, I'm human like you and I know getting rid of the old is hard. Not just with genes, but behaviors and, and habits and, and words. We've got, we've got to get rid of the old. It isn't easy, but it is worth it. Why? Because Jesus has something more for you. He has something better for you. He has something good for you. Remember when I tell you all the time that Jesus didn't come to really take from you, he came to give to you, and what he came to give to you is abundant life, a full life, a good life. He wants you to feel hope and joy and peace and purpose, and remember, he has this incredible purpose for your life. His purpose for your life is that you would help bring a taste of heaven down to earth. We know we're all fortunate to be living in paradise, right? Right? We can send you away if you don't like it here, okay? We love paradise. We know it's, it's paradise, but we also know this place needs a taste of heaven, and God wants to use you to bring a taste of heaven down to earth. When we can be renewed in our thinking, when we can allow our minds to be renewed by scripture and by prayer and by teaching and by God's people, then we can get busy with having an influence on the world instead of being so influenced by the world. He's got this purpose for you, an incredible, deep, abundant purpose. So I want you to know this as I close up. You're not gonna be perfect. The purpose of today is not walking out of here being like, oh, I was reminded I'm imperfect. Of course you are. I'm the king of imperfect in this place. You're not gonna be perfect. But we also don't need to be complacent. We don't need to be lazy. We don't need to be unwise. We wanna be good managers of our lives that God has given us. You're not gonna be perfect. But what you can do as you experience the renewing of your mind is you can spend your life pointing people to the one who is perfect. Let's not try to steal his glory. Let's not try to steal his light. Let's not try to be the hero of the story. Let's not try to be the one that can save and set people free. Let's not be say, hey, look at me. No, 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 let's look at him because he is good and he is holy and he is merciful and he is gracious and he is, by the way, perfect. We believe that around here. We believe, contrary to that sarcastic essay I read you, we don't believe Jesus is just another good teacher. We don't believe he's just a good guy. He has a pretty decent set of morals and he'd be fun to hang out with. No, we believe he's perfect and we believe he is God and we believe he's the son of God and that because he is perfect, he's the only one that could come to, to reverse the brokenness that is inside all of us. The Bible talks about it as sin. And so he came from heaven to earth out of his love for us and he died on the cross, a spiritual death that we deserve experiencing separation from his heavenly father so we could be forgiven, so we could be free so we could spend eternity in heaven. In the meantime, we could work to bring a taste of heaven down to earth. I'm gonna pray for us, and then we're gonna share a meal that we call communion and that we share every single week. God, we're so thankful for you. We're so thankful for your love and your kindness. We're so thankful that you give us this beautiful identity, and then you call us into this beautiful life. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't be satisfied to live a futile, empty life, that everyone else around us may be living, but everyone else around us is helpless and hopeless and empty and broken. We don't have to be that way because we have Jesus. So Lord, let us live full, abundant, purposeful lives that you would give us the power and the courage to be done with the old and embrace the new. It's, it's uncomfortable and it's challenging, but it's holy and it's good. So Lord, let us be a people that care about holiness. So we don't settle for legalism, just following rules, but we care about holiness, becoming more and more like our Heavenly Father. Thank you that because we're not perfect, the perfect one came to live and to die to welcome us into the family of God so we can live this meaningful and purposeful life here and spend forever with you in heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.